listening to our, as you are listening to our presentation, then um, we can address those as well. So I will start sharing my screen. All right, everyone see that okay? Awesome. All right, so let's just jump right in. What is a physician scientist? So obviously they combine the role of a physician and a scientist. And depending on the career pathway that you decide to pursue, the balance between the clinical duties and your researcher or scientist duties will be different. But you as a physician scientist can be involved in a variety of things. So that can be treating patients, leading a research lab, running clinical trials, mentoring trainees, teaching classes to students, developing medications, treatments, and devices, or a combination of these things. And there are different types of physician scientists. So you can have, again, a combination of degrees. So it can be a medical degree, whether that is the doctorate of medicine or a doctorate of osteopathic medicine, or you can do a dual degree. So both your clinical degree alongside a PhD. And that PhD can be focused on different subject areas. So it can be in the basic sciences, but basic sciences, so cell biology, neuroscience, um, cancer biology, for example, what we typically consider as wet lab research. It can also be in the social sciences, so epidemiology, sociology, anthropology. And in the second hour of today's session, we'll actually be joined by a medical anthropologist who does work in that field. Um, so it'll be great to hear from her. You could also do it in the clinical science, so quality improvement and clinical trials. Um, but it can be a wide variety of things that you focus your research on. Um, but what is specifically that dual degree pathway? So it's someone that, again, holds that clinical degree, but their doctorate in that specific science subject. Why would anyone want to do that? Well, you can draw connections from your clinical experience and your research. We have this bench to bedside ideology where you can apply these discoveries you're making in the research lab to your patients, but also vice versa works, right? So the bedside to bench where you can learn from your patients and figure out how to uh, create specific treatment, for example, but you can learn from the lab and apply it directly is the point. Um, and MD-PhDs actually end up in a wide variety of subjects. So you can see here, internal medicine is where majority of the MD-PhDs end up, but there's representation in uh, virtually any subject. And how do you kind of go about this timeline? So let's say you are at a community co community college, for example, right now, you do your two years, you integrate into a four-year institution to complete um, your bachelor's degree, you can take a gap year or two, or you could just jump right into an MD-PhD program. And depending on the program you're in, depending on what you decide to do your PhD in, um, it could be about seven to eight years. So the timeline within that pathway is typically you have your two years of the preclinical um, um, sciences, so your M1 and, and your M2 year, then you can integrate into your PhD years. Again, that can vary. So three years up to five, six, seven years. Then you go back and you finish your medical degree by doing your clinical rotations. And to be a practicing physician, you will then have to follow that up with a residency. Um, but then there's also these research focused programs called, called PC. PSTPs, where you can also be doing research in the time of your residency. Um, but again, you can do really a combination of these different um, pathways. So let's say you're at a four-year institution, you decided to take some classes at a community college, and then um, you go back into a four-year institution, then go into an MD-PhD. You might even throw in a gap year or two during that time, but the pathway is going to vary. Um, so the pros and cons of just doing that clinical degree or combining that with a PhD. So just doing that clinical degree and doing some type of research during that uh, time or during re doing research after you get your MD or DO, it's going to be a shorting training time, right? There's not a block of time that is specifically for the PhD. So there's no lapse in that clinical training. The cons of that, though, the research training time is not well defined. You'll just kind of have to make time as you go through throughout your um, clinical training. And if provided with research training, it is often not as rigorous. So there's not that focused time that you get to really dive into a research project as you would with your PhD. So the pros of an MD, PhD, or a DO, PhD, school is often completely paid for. So you're given a stipend, but also your tuition for medical school is paid for. Um, you have rigorous research training during your PhD years, and you're more competitive for research positions 
positions after you finish um, your MD PhD training. And yes, your training time is increased. You may end up only using one degree depending on what type of balance you want later on. And it's difficult to keep up with the clinical knowledge during your PhD training. So like I said earlier, you might do your PhD training in the middle of your medical school training. And um, we can talk about this later on, later on in the panel, but really, uh, it depends if you even need to keep up with that clinical knowledge because, you know, anyone loses knowledge that they learn from one year to the next. So um, we can talk about how that uh, how how the students here on the panel are dealing with that. So applying to an MD, PhD or DO, PhD program, it's really similar to your medical school admissions. So as you guys know, there's that AMCAS platform to apply to medical schools. And generally you have that personal statement of why medical school, but if you decide to apply to the MD, PhD or DO, PhD, you also have two additional essays of why do you wanna do an MD, PhD? And then an essay describing your significant research experiences. Because you have an entire essay devoted to research experiences, research is very important. Um, it's really, really integral, to, especially to an MD-PhD application, alongside your coursework that you do during your undergraduate training. So one year each of general chemistry, organic, biology, and physics, plus the labs for these classes. And it, it, it will depend on the school that you're applying to. So look into that um, based on what schools you're interested in. There are also other classes that might be required, but these classes specifically are really important for the MCAT, which is that entrance exam for a medical school. Alongside your volunteering, leadership experience, shadowing, and letters of recommendation, these are all integral to your application for an MD-PhD or DO-PhD program. So how can you do research? Well, you definitely want to get started early. So connect with potential people that are around you. So it could be at your institution, or you can look if other institutions around you are doing some type of assistantship or some type of summer research experience. And it's more so about the quality instead of the quantity. So you staying with the lab for three years, four years is more important than doing many different research experiences at different labs. And you really want to become an expert in your own project. So let's say you did one project for three years, that one project, you can publish papers from it, you can present it at different conferences and get a lot out of it as opposed to different research labs. And you definitely want to demonstrate growth towards independence. So let's say you started off your research years um, working with a graduate student, but by the time you were close to graduating, you were able to uh, um, develop a sort of independence during that time. And again, like I said, you can do research assistantships either at your school or surrounding schools, and many schools do summer research experiences. So let's say there's a school that you're interested in applying for their medical school, you might want to look into if they have a summer research opportunity that can get, get you connected to that school. You can also do research after you get your bachelor's degree, and there are many structured programs um, out there, for example, with the NIH or the NCI. So at this point, I want to welcome all of our speakers and just introduce yourself real quickly, and we can jump into the questions. Danielle? Yeah, hi, everyone. My name is Danielle Sawyer. I'm a fifth year, as it shows on the screen. Um, and I am currently at the point where I am about to graduate my PhD and transition back to medical school. So I'm kind of in that phase of the program right now. Um, and I'm happy to answer any more specific questions about my background, but I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Britt? Hello, my name is Britt. Uh, I'm in the same boat as Danielle. We're in the same cohort, same university, so University of Arizona and Tucson. Um, I'm a neuroscience PhD student in my last year, my PhD as well, and I study chaperone protein inhibitors to treat Alzheimer's disease. Um, I'm an open book, um, pretty much no topic is like off limits with me, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And Anthony? Hi, I'm Anthony. I'm a fourth year uh, student up at Stony Brook University in Long Island. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it. I'll keep it short. Yeah, thank you. And we'll jump right into the questions that were submitted ahead of time. So the first question that I have that came up a few times is, how did you come to the decision of pursuing, pursuing an MD PhD and not just an MD or a PhD? Anyone can go at this. 
I guess for me, I was always drawn to the MD because I had actually like pretty bad experiences as like a chronically ill um, adolescent and child, and I just wanted to make medicine better. And then I think I was a sophomore when I realized that MD PhD was a thing, and I absolutely love science. I love research. Um, even in undergrad, I was always trying to like figure out what was going on in academic papers. And I had no idea what was going on. Um, and I just really wanted to try it and kind of shoot for the stars and see if I could do both. And luckily it worked out. Um, and I think the defining moment of making sure that I really wanted to do research was I was working really late in a virology lab. So my first lab as an undergraduate, and I just felt like this inner peace, just like hearing the autoclave, making it sounds and like just really loving what I was doing, being really passionate about what I was doing, um, especially when I talked to people outside of the field. And that's when it really like confirmed for me, okay, yeah, I can do this forever. I can be in a really long degree program, have a really fulfilling career because like I never get bored of the bench work. I'm definitely a wet lab person. So um, that was my defining moment. Sorry. Um, I think for me, um, I actually was like dead set on going to medical school. I always knew that I wanted to help people and that I love science and medicine really just felt like a calling for me. And um, I did, you know, some research experience through my community college and um, a partnering institution. And I just fell in love with the research and what I was doing. And I thought it was so cool to be able to have a question and be able to answer it rigorously and test it and really get to the bottom of what was going on. And um, that kind of sparked my passion for research. And I had a lot of discouragement about going into an MD-PhD program. You know, no one can do both careers, um, you know, very long work hours. And, you know, it's impossible to do both and do them well. Um, but I persisted anyway, and I, I had some good mentorship, I think, along the way. And, um, you know, I think in retrospect, I found that I really love like clinical medicine. I love it so much. I don't think I could ever do just solely research. Um, so I think I'm leaning more towards like clinical trials research. And those are kind of like more of my um, latest interests and in what I kind of see myself doing like long term. Um, but um, I feel really grateful to have gone through this program. I would echo a, a lot of things that have already been said. Um, I would say one of my main deciding factors is uh, indecisiveness in going into this, in that um, I really enjoy like theoretical neuroscience and kind of very theory based work. But the downside was I felt like I kept losing a lot of touch with like any kind of application and some of that work. So um, I was didn't want to do just a PhD and uh, end up like losing all clinical relevance. And at the same time, I also don't really like lab work uh, that much, like wet labs. So um, human neuroimaging was kind of where I settled on. And I was like, well, I would love to continue doing theory work, but also have a human component. So I think medicine is probably the right combination there. And so that way it kind of, by keeping the MD for the human side of things, then I can do more theory stuff during the PhD and not feel like I'm going to end up, you know, just missing out on all of that. A follow-up question to that, do you think doing the dual degree detracted from doing either degree separately? Do you feel like you lost anything? I think, I... Sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, I don't think that I lost anything. I think, in fact, I gained something. I think that the way that I was able to think about um, a lot of the... Um, you know, scientific questions that my colleagues, my PhD only colleagues, and just think about it from a completely different perspective, putting the human patient first, really considering, is this going to make an impact? I think, in fact, it was probably better. And also, I think coursework wise, you do less coursework, but it's because you already have so much experience in a different field than your colleagues, but still in medicine coming in. That was exactly the phrase that I was going to use. So you, you don't lose anything, you gain something. And part of it is that time that you do take less time. If you know you're going to want to do both, then you do take less time by combining them early on rather than trying to do them separately. And honestly, like 
once you get to graduate level coursework, you just kind of want to be doing research and not more courses. You do run out of time and steam to continue just learning things in a classroom. I'll also add, so you're in an interesting position to kind of bridge the two ideas of medicine and research together. And I found that it's kind of a cool connecting point between different faculty members too. So you have your College of Medicine faculty who go to bat for you, and then you have your graduate school faculty who go to bat for you, and you kind of create this network um, and some really cool collaborative projects can come out of that too. Um, and also, I don't think I lose anything. Um, I feel like in my PhD years, I have a little bit more time than in, you know, MS1, MS2, where you're always studying to actually like explore some clinical things. So like I shadow um, sometimes weekly at an Alzheimer's Institute and um, shadow a family medicine doctor who's also a geriatrician, who's like amazing and taught me so much already just in the past maybe six months. Um, and I just didn't have a whole lot of time to do that while I was studying for, you know, board exams and stuff. So I can kind of like, like dabble and explore more of the clinical side, even though I'm in the PhD side. Um, and that's also true. Well, it's like I'm able to do that because I have a really good research mentor who gives me time to do that too, which is really important. Um, but you can kind of make it work um, and use your PhD to explore a lot of different things. So I don't think I've lost just anything. Same with the, the other two, like mostly gained things. And really, going back to what I said earlier, you have this blocked out time specifically for your research training, as opposed to if you were going through medical school, you really have to force like summers or time between studying for board exams to get some kind of research experience. And in the end, as an MD, PhD, you have the opportunity to go into so many different careers. So you can continue to practice medicine and run a lab. You can go into biotech. You can go into so many different um, fields. And then also you have that clinical background, right? So you are a physician scientist as opposed to if you did your PhD, you wouldn't have that clinician background. And if you did your MD only with research experience, um, as opposed to a complete PhD, again, you don't have that training to really um, uh, go about with research. Um, but kind of backing out, backing um, into the application process, did you find any challenges for doing research in community colleges? Because I know you guys all came from community college backgrounds. And if you didn't do research, how did you explain that gap in research experience? So um, I'll just go first. My community college didn't have any research opportunities. Like there was barely any student groups that were really STEM focused. So I was kind of on my own and it wasn't until I transferred to university that I started really thinking about, you know, whose lab would I want to try out research in? Um, the lab I ended up going into actually, my PI requires like you get a certain grade in his classes before you join his lab. Um, which sounds really harsh, but he's actually the most laid back guy ever, which is kind of funny. Um, but I didn't start doing research until my senior year of university. So I kind of had like a later start than some people, um, but the opportunities just weren't there. And for me personally, that never came up. I never had anyone ask like, how, you know, how dare you not do research during community college when you're like working three jobs and all this stuff. Like I had a pretty rough time, honestly, um, trying to just afford rent and food and also go to school. So I think that it hasn't ever hurt me that I started a little bit later. I also was able to target a lab that was something I really cared about to really like go all in and see like, okay, could I do this for, you know, the rest of my life um, kind of test. So um, for me, not really a whole lot of opportunities, but it didn't end up hurting me too bad. I would echo a lot of that too. Uh, I did not do any research before my junior year after I'd transferred. There really wasn't any research at my community college. Um, I will say the one thing that kind of, you know, happened formatively there, and I think that's a word, um, for me there was um, taking, instead of a normal bio sequence, I took anatomy and physiology um, because they had a strong nursing program. So I just kind of ended up hanging out with medical professionals and that fostered that interest, but I did not do any research until junior year after I had transferred, and uh, similarly, nobody's ever asked me about that. I feel pretty lucky because my community college, um, we had a fantastic professor who 
um, connected us with almost every opportunity there was. Um, and I got to work at a neighboring um, private research institute. Um, and that was a really great experience. Um, so I, I kind of got lucky. But I can say after sitting, I've sat on medical and MD patient admissions and all of that, um, that it really, um, like, people are so understanding of, you know, the fact that a lot of community colleges don't have research programs and you can't do research there. Um, I do think it is hard once you get to university to, to get into a lab with no experience, but I don't think it's impossible. And I think you should try early on, you know, as soon as you get there, try to get into a lab. Um, but it's definitely challenging. And I would say also identifying mentors that could help you get research opportunities is really important. So I know at a lot of universities, they have, um, you know, different research advisors, they might have like a student success center, they might have research programs, you can talk to your biology and chemistry professors, and they can lead you in the right direction. So finding a good lab, I think is really important, because these people can put you on to a lot of opportunities. Um, but also kind of in the same uh, pathway, what is something you wish you knew in your undergraduate years preparing for graduate school applications? I have a, a good one and I'll go first if that's okay. Um, so one thing I wish I knew is um, the fact that programs actually wish that applicants applied sooner um, with less research experience. Um, we had our external advisory review board come out um, and there were basically the head of like many MD PhD programs across the country. And they were asking us, hey, you know, how do we get students to apply earlier? They just want more and more and more and just like want to be so competitive with their peers. But really we want them to feel like they can apply, you know, as a senior in college. And we understand that they can't do all this research experience and aren't going to have as much as somebody that did two gap years, but that's okay. Like we don't want them to spend their whole lives in training. Like we want them to ultimately be able to get to their end goal sooner. And that's something I wish that I knew. I also wish I knew that. Um, I, the first, I'm a reapplicant, so I got into my MD PhD program my second try. My first try, I didn't get any interviews, but I was also just like so busy and working really hard, and I was just like barely making deadlines. And I feel like you shouldn't do that. Like you should always try to, you know, apply early, contact programs early, and just double check. Like, you know, sometimes there are courses that maybe that maybe translate to what they want for a prerequisite or maybe they don't. And it's really good to know that early on instead of, you know, the day before the deadline or or something like that. Like don't procrastinate um, and try to go forward with an open mind. Um, and also I kind of wish I knew literally anything about applying. I had no idea where to start. I had no idea like how the MCAT would be judged. I had no idea what step one was, which is like the MCAT's bigger, beefier cousin in med school. like still like a nine hour long exam and really tough, but also on shuffle mode. So you don't have different sections. And that was really overwhelming. Um, I just wish that I had a bit better advice going in. Um, I think if I had connected with a medical student who had gone through it, I would have had such an easier time. Um, but because a lot of the pre-medical advisors maybe haven't gone through it themselves or, you know, they're getting the only information that they get sometimes is like what we can access online too, which is not always the right information. Um, so I wish that I had a bit more guidance probably from a medical student who had recently gone through it and also um, like stay away from toxic websites. So like there are definitely some really toxic pre-medical websites out there that will say, oh no, you'll never get in if you don't have an eight bajillion score on MCAT. And it like, that doesn't matter at all sometimes. Um, so don't take like the anonymous posts to heart that are on some of these websites. Um, I wish I had known that too, because I thought Oh man, maybe I have like no chance at all. Um, but I'm glad that I decided to ignore that and just keep going. I would agree, and I would say on a similar note, um, I wish I would know had known like what really distinguishes you. Like having been on the admissions committee now for, for a couple of years, um, 
like once you're above like a basic, you know, GPA and MCAT, it really doesn't matter anymore. Like, you know, 4.0 is not going to matter to you much more than a 3.7 when you get to the interview stage. Um, what they're going to be looking at more is like how you can talk about your own research, like and your own experiences and your letters of recommendation. So like being able to form genuine connections with like clinical or research mentors who can then write really well about you and then being able to understand and speak to your own experiences is tends to be way more important. Um, I think to the admissions process. Absolutely, I can echo everything that was said. Um, a question that was said in the chat: What would you say is the basic MCAT and GPA you want to be above for MD PhD programs? I think. I, oh no! Go ahead, Anthony. I'll let you go this time. Sorry. Um, I was going to say, I don't think that there's a hard and fast rule for anywhere. Um, I would say uh, from my personal experience, we have to discuss with the medical school, anybody that we admit. So you should look at what the typical scores are for the associated medical school, because there's likely going to be some conversation along those lines. So again, not a hard and fast cutoff, but if you look at the distribution for those med students, that's fairly representative of what you're going to want to see. There is more wiggle room because we do evaluate, you know, on research dimension as well, more heavily than the medical school. But um, yeah, I would say just look at that. I also wanted to point out, so um, I don't know what Brianna is doing in APSA now, but Brianna has been involved in APSA for a really long time. Um, and she published this article that I put in chat. That's really important because most times programs will just report a mean GPA and they'll say, oh yeah, the mean GPA is you know, 3.9 or 3.8, um, but they never really report on like, you know, what is the lowest they admit? What is the highest they admit? So this article that I linked kind of talks about the range. Like even if you have a 2.8 GPA, but you went and got a master's degree or you just did some like really amazing research, sometimes that can like kind of make up for that. Sometimes people are very understanding you know, if you have a family death or if you have something like really big that happens in your life that impacts your academics, um, like admissions committees are not out to get you. Most of them are just trying their best to, you know, see if you're a good fit and try to understand your story. So being able to convey your story is really important. Um, but I wouldn't say there is, I mean, like medical schools themselves do sometimes have basic cutoff scores, but Sometimes, like, there are exceptions. Um, they're rare, but they do happen. Um, and just don't get discouraged. You know, if you see a mean score that's, like, way higher than yours, know that that's an average. So you always have, you know, very privileged, very high income, very well-trained people that have gone through, like, months and months of, like, legit hands-on tutoring for the MCAT. And then there's people that, like, maybe didn't have study resources, could only take a week off work to study and just went in and did it. Like this is how I did it. And I feel like admissions committees usually can understand the difference in like resource disparities between whether you had everything you needed or you didn't, um, and then how that's reflected in your score. And I hope that most admissions committees do that. I know our school does a really good job of actually talking about like, okay, what could be the reason, you know, this GPA is low or, you know, this class was failed or retaken or whatever. Um, also, you know, seeing like, seeing someone's academics get better. So like early on, if they're really like not doing well and then they improve over time, that is way more important than seeing someone start really doing really well and then like kind of get worse and worse and worse. So like just always kind of have hope that you can like keep trying and like be stubborn and stubborn as possible. Um, if you have any of like these like blemishes on your transcripts or anything um, and then just don't lose hope and just keep trying. Yeah, all great points. Danielle, did you have something to add? Oh yeah, I just wanted to add really quick. Um, I would say I would agree with everything that's been said. Um, I would also say there is um some data that does show that beyond a 506 MCAT score, you're equally likely to pass your board exams, which is one important metric that the school really cares about. So that's kind of like, you know, a soft, you know, kind of 
um, line that exists. Um, but I think as long as you're at the level where they will accept your secondary application or they will send you a secondary application, you've kind of met that minimum screening, there's always still a chance. Your application is outstanding. Your research is outstanding. You had a hard time in life. You know, you've been on an upward trend. Um, you know, I think that there's still a chance and um, you still have to be competitive with the people that you're applying with. They're also awesome. You know, it can be more difficult, but, um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't worry about, I think people worry a little too much about um, scores. It's only one tiny portion of your application in the big scheme of things. It's just a conversation of, is a student likely to do well on their courses and on their exam? Yes. Check. Okay. Now, what else? Are they a good human? Do they, you know, really care about research? Like all these other more important things. Yeah, I would say a lot of schools are going towards that holistic approach. So you definitely have to have a story and a theme with your application. But also remember, like Britt made an important point, important points in your application, everything you're doing while also pursuing school is written. So you're working a few jobs, you know, if you had some issues in the family, all that will be in your application. So they will consider all these things while also putting it aside your um, GPA and your scores. So I would say if you fall within the range of the MCAT score or the GPA, just go for it, apply. You never know what's going to come out, but also your passion will come through within your writing and within your own interviews um, as well. Um, but for the MCAT, I think a resource that I didn't know until later on is UWorld. I can write it in the chat as well. But UWorld is really, I think, the key to getting a good score on the MCAT um, alongside doing AAMC practice tests. Um, so at this point, I will open it up to the audience for any questions. And we're very honest here, so don't feel shy or anything. I'll say to the U World point, the um, I wish I had known about it before med school because I spend so much time on it during my preclinical. So it's a very good sanity check. Like if you don't enjoy doing that, then you will not have a good time in med school, at least the preclinical phase. I, from what I've heard, the clinicals too. Yeah, I'm very bad on multiple choice exams and med school is all multiple choice exams. So maybe another point, like as you guys are thinking about questions, if you have a disability, um, it's very important to get accommodations for it in medical school and graduate school. You don't want to be taking multiple choice exams if you need extra time. Um, and you don't want to try to like brave it through it without accommodations because it's like very hard. Also to that point, the earlier you get accommodations, the better, because a lot of accommodations are self-nesting. Like it, you have to justify, why didn't you ask for this earlier on uh, to some of these like standardized exams? So it's just better to, if you want to work with that office, then you should work with them very soon. And they're usually very friendly in my experience. I'll ask a question on the same topic before we get into the chat questions. Someone said, how do you get over the test anxiety hurdle, especially because there are so many exams, not only with MCAT, but with med school, board exams? Um, and then how do you also get over imposter syndrome if you have experienced that? I'd say I don't have an answer because I'm still really anxious every exam and I still have imposter syndrome. Sometimes even like I'm invited to panels, I'm like, oh my gosh, you want me? Like, I still am battling it. I don't really have great advice, but I guess be kind to yourself. Um, usually I get hit with like a two or three day migraine after a big exam and I just have to take care of myself. And um, it's really important to uh, like schedule nice things for yourself after you have big accomplishments. Like my first medical school exam after I passed it. I went and bought a porch swing so I could sit outside with my cats and just like hang out. Um, and that was a really big thing to get for myself. I don't know if that's silly, but just try to celebrate your wins as much as possible. Um, and if you're an anxious person like me, um, sometimes the anxiety can help you get through things and sometimes it can be detrimental. Just try your best to use it as a tool as best as you can. For me, I get um... I don't really, I think I've been so exposed to so many exams, exams, exams that I just like have lost the ability to even have anxiety over taking an exam. Um, but 
I do get imposter syndrome and it it happened when I got into the MD PhD program. I remember like the first week of classes, I just thought, oh my gosh, is someone gonna come in and be like, Oh, we we actually got the wrong Danielle. Like, you gotta get out of here. Like, not Danielle Sawyer, someone else. And I'm starting to get it again as I'm wrapping up my PhD, which will have taken three years, which is kind of record time. And I'm like, I'm not qualified to to get my PhD in that short of an amount of time. I feel like, you know, I lost intelligence during this whole process. But um, I think the biggest thing for me with fighting imposter syndrome is I know there's a lot of voices and things that you hear, um, mostly from people that are a little disgruntled with MD PhDs. And I think um, I just try to remind myself not to let them like get the best of me and not to let them, you know, have that power of like, making me feel bad about myself and just try to really, um, you know, empower myself and just like, <laughs> keep reminding myself, like, it's gonna be okay. And I think it's something probably I'll experience the rest of my career. Honestly, it's getting worse every time. Um, but i um, learning to cope with it. So yeah. I would say those are great answers. I don't have much to add. Um, on the imposter syndrome thing, I think for me, it's worn off just gradually. Like from the structure of my lab, we have very frequent calls with like a lot of people who are uh, running their own labs already. And so that was very intimidating at the first point. Like, you know, I'm supposed to talk about what I'm doing to people who are essentially experts already. And then, you know, two years in now, it's just a very routine thing. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, I, I know what I'm talking about and they know that I know. So this is fine. And um, for test taking, I felt like very quickly in med school, I got a sense of when I would be ready for the test. So my curriculum is pass fail for the preclinical phase. And that really helps so that you have like, you don't have the stress of needing a grade, needing to get a grade right then. Um, and so that just kind of provided a buffer to figure out, okay, I know when I'm ready to pass and I can be confident going in. I would say the same thing is I'm just gonna add my input real quick. Um, I feel like with the test anxiety, once I realized, okay, there are people whose you know health is in my hands I took everything that I've studying super seriously and this test is just a way to test what you have learned so far and your school really will work with you if um, you're having any difficulties with that and then for imposter syndrome like as simple as this sounds if you weren't meant to be here you would not be here like simply put, you would not be here if you were not meant to be here. And you have this passion for a reason and I would urge everyone to pursue their passions. Um, and then also be patient with yourself during the process. Like what you know, first year medical student is really different as you know a fourth year medical student who has also gone through the PhD. And then you as a graduate student is different than someone who is a postdoctoral you know, fellow. So just pa be patient with, your, with yourself and trust the process. Um, let's attack some things in the chat. Do you have any regrets with the way you've gone through your MD PhD path so far? Is there anything that you would have done completely different or change if you had the opportunity? Um, so I'll I'll speak up real quick. So I had like my first PhD lab was not a good fit, and I actually ended up switching labs after my first nine months to a year. Um, and I wish that, you know, at the first sign of mistreatment or the first sign of like a PI, like misbehaving, that I would have just like left. Um, I spent way too long trying to like gauge, okay, am I being sensitive or is this really a problem? Um, and it wasn't until I like started seeing like the mistreatment of others, I was like, okay, maybe this is a problem that's not a good environment for me, but I stayed in it for a little bit too long. So like my current research would be far ahead if I had joined the lab that I'm currently in rather than the first one that I tried to join. Um, but it was during like the start of the pandemic. So rotations were really hard to do. Um, it's hard to like gauge attitudes and things like while you're six feet away from people. Um, so I think that maybe some advice I'd give is like, if you get this gut feeling that maybe like your advisor or someone in your lab doesn't like you or they're like yelling at you or there's like red flags just make sure you like write them down date them timestamp them and keep like a log of them because i feel like if i did that i would have probably left a lot sooner than like hanging on for as long as i did um so definitely like pay attention to your gut feelings um 
Uh, Lisa had her hand up. Hello, thank you so much for having um, this seminar. I'm getting, I'm like the nerves are there because I'm applying in the upcoming cycle. My question to the panelists would be, if your research interest goes across several dis di different disciplines, how do you kind of narrow, like for example, for social sciences, they're not a lot of programs. So, but how do you kind of narrow your choices when you are trying to figure out which route to go, which program would be the best? I, I can uh, advertise my school here. The, and this is not unique to Stony Brook. I just don't know the list offhand because there are many schools that do this now. You're admitted to the MD PhD program, but not to the PhD department. So you have flexibility while you're in medical school to decide exactly which department um, fits you the best. So in my case, I was admitted to the program and then I rotated with a couple different labs and wound up doing biomedical engineering largely because it, uh, I had enough overlap between my medical courses and my undergrad courses to completely evade coursework, which is my priority because I wanted to get into research. Um, but frequently, you know, if you find a PI in a different department, then the graduate school would not have any trouble, at least at my school, admitting you because they know you're a solid student. So there is some flexibility once you get in. I would also add to that that it is important to uh, maybe more so than identifying a program, identify um, mentors at that institution that you are interested in doing research with them. At the end of the day, when you have your PhD, it's kind of like a bachelor degree where it doesn't really matter what it says on paper. Um, it's more about the project and what you did. It could say for like Brit neuroscience versus med farm versus, you know, like it's all um, doesn't matter as much as like what you actually did and what you're learning. And so I think schools really look for the fact that you have identified multiple faculty at their institution because we're concerned from our perspective that um, if you apply and you get in and then you don't have a mentor, anyone you're interested in working with, that's like a nightmare situation for us. Um, so it's I think that's really important. That's actually a question that I got in my MD PhD interview is you know, if you got accepted, which faculty are you interested in doing research with? So definitely be prepared to answer that question. Um, but I'm gonna move on with questions so that we're able to um, uh, tackle as many as possible. Someone also asked, how do you know if your school's values and cohort culture would be a good fit for you? I would say definitely take advantage of second looks or first look events where you can physically like go there in person and see how people interact. Um, we're kind of lucky because we interviewed back in the before times um, when interviews were in person and we would fly out. Um, and one thing that I saw when I was here was that, you know, while they were giving us tours of the medical school or we were going to lunches or, you know, meeting other applicants or meeting different faculty, you know, if the med student leading the tour was walking by, another student would come in to like, oh, how are you doing? And like give them a hug. And I was like, is this staged or are they actually this nice here? Um, and it turned out they're actually this nice here. Like people are very supportive. Um, and uh, it's, it's good to see those kind of interactions. And on Zoom, you can't really see those things. Um, but at our school, we try pretty hard, like we have like a discord server and we try to make sure people can contact a lot of our students, like if they ever need help or if they have technical problems um, or, you know, their power goes out for their interview, then they're OK, we'll like reschedule, it'll be fine. Um, and I think schools that go out of their way or programs that go out of their way to make sure like you don't have any extra stress or you have nothing extra to freak out about, um, it's kind of like a green flag. Um, so that's, that's what I would say, it's just like, Try your best if you have the opportunity to go see them, go see the program in the wild um, in person. Yeah, any other uh, burning questions? We have about nine more minutes until the second part of the event starts. I just wanted to add to the last um, question just very quickly. Um, you're going to be there for seven to eight years. So you better make sure that you like living there and you like the people that you're with. I think that's really 
um, more important than you could even imagine. <laughs> Yeah, I would say finding community in your MD, PhD cohort. So specifically the MD, PhD students, because um, the medical students that you enter with, they will go ahead and graduate and, you know, you're still doing your PhD year. So, you know, you, you'll establish all our friendships with them, but you also want to um, be have a good community with your MD, PhD. Um, so a question that was also asked is, what does your day to day look like? And we can just kind of go around and ask about this. Anthony? Um, currently, it's a little bit hectic because we're setting up a new study. Um, so I'm doing a lot of patient scanning right now. Um, but normally, it's like a mix of uh, processing neuroimaging data, talking with um, half of my thesis work is on software development. So talking with people who work on that side of things and um, just figuring out the technical problems there. And then, um, yeah, like I said, right now, most days, every other week are scanning uh, either our healthy controls or folks with bipolar disorder in the MRI scanner. So it's kind of actually a mix of clinical and PhD, but it's not really usually like that. Brett? Uh, so my days can vary. So right now I'm helping train a student who's really interested in learning, uh, rotating graduate student interested in learning the assays that I've been doing. So I've been doing like Morris water maze, which is very cute. Um, you just have mice swim and find an underwater platform and test their memory and how much they can remember that their platform is there because they really don't like swimming. Um, and a lot of memory assays um, and a lot of different behavior work. And like today before this panel, I had a lab meeting and uh, my lab meetings are very friendly and open so I could go in and just start talking about some random thing that, uh, that I saw today about AI generated images and publishing and like how bizarre it is. and. So talking to everyone about it um, and it's just it's a really nice um, day to day like if I like I do have health problems you know like if I can't do something I can like rely on a lab mate to help me complete my work or like you know do an injection for that day or something like that um, so my day to day is mostly that and a lot of data analysis a lot of like scoring behavior videos on my computer um, and then I go home and play World of Warcraft pretty much got to have that life work balance. <laughs> Danielle? Mine is a little bit different. I'm in the transition to the um, clinical um, program again. So I'm kind of in this reintegration phase where um, I've been going in in the mornings into our standardized patient clinics and practicing my um, history and physicals and, you know, presenting and all of that clinical stuff that I've forgotten over the past three years. Um, I'm also getting ready for like our orientation week next week and then doing a lot of writing um, for my dissertation as well as um, the paper we are submitting soon. Um, so my day is a little bit less um, experiment based. That's awesome. So I hear that all of you have basic like a foot in the clinical, but you know, you're not too worried about with the clinical experiences because most schools you know, they're not just going to throw you back into clinicals. They'll they'll retrain you, you know, and, and some of the stuff actually sticks more than you thought. So um, Ashley has her hand up. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Thank you guys so much. This has been really, really insightful and helpful. Um, so this is more of a personalized question, but I'm currently at the NIH doing a post back and um, I'm like, I came to decide like if I wanted to do the MD PhD like commit to it or just like do MD with research but um ultimately I'm still at a point where I don't know and I'm applying this upcoming cycle I was just wondering for the application process um I've done like some research experiences over the summer and then some at my home institution at Penn State and now I'm doing this NIH one and I don't know like do I need letters from everybody or like how would I navigate like if a summer research project was really monumental, more than something I did for three years to me. Would it look bad if I use that in an NIH letter or were, like a research project I was on for a long time? Um, sorry, Kevin. Okay, sorry. Um, I would say in general, the rule of thumb that I've heard and I like is uh, 
if it's important to you and you have a letter from the mentor, then go ahead and put it down. It's absolutely good to write about it, no matter the duration. If you say it's important to you and there is no letter from the mentor, then that can raise questions. There can be good reasons for that. Um, but it is better if like you can emphasize that with some other external support, either, you know, like publication or a letter from them. But I would say overall, the length does not matter. Thank you. All right, we have three more minutes. Are there any other quick questions in the audience? I might just add, I know Ashley had talked about, you know, deciding on whether to do an MD PhD or just an MD and do research. And I think the big thing to consider, I wish somebody would have told me is that, um, I would really only consider if you want to like really run a lab or do independent research and get independent funding. But if you just want to do, you know, um, clinical research or um, whatnot, usually you don't, I mean, you have a graduate level degree as an MD, you don't need to do the full like MD PhD. It's a lot of time. Um, I know financially there's a benefit, but I would just really consider like, what do you want your ultimate career to look like? And also large academic institutions aren't all over the place. They're usually only in big cities. Do you want to live the rest of your life in a place like a big city and, and work there or um, or not? There's also time to figure that out. If you don't know right away after your undergraduate years, take a gap year or two. The average age for medical school is definitely like 26 or 27. And you know most people don't integrate right after their undergraduate year. So take some time to figure that out. If you want to do research, if you want to increase your clinical experience, um, you have that option. If you want to just work and relax while also applying, that's also an option. Um, but you guys will be contacted from me to do a post-event survey. And I will also share the panelists, if they let me, their emails um, and alongside my email as well. And if you want to be involved with the American Physician Scientist Association, it will be a good way to network with other medical students. Even there's an undergraduate um, uh, portion and where you can network with other undergraduates who are interested in the same pathway. And we have a joint meeting in April that you can attend as well. Um, but thank you guys so much for joining. A big thank you to our panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules um, to share some information with us. We will have the next session back in the break room, in the main room um, at approximately one minute. <laughs> so you can join back in the main room. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you.